Okay. All right. <laughs> Welcome everyone to the latest virtual monthly installment of the EFF Austin Meetup. My name is Kevin Welch. I'm the current president of the board at EFF Austin. Um, we also have our board member David Hemsley here tonight who will be uh, live tweeting the meeting on our Twitter account. Um, I see old and new faces. Um, for those of you uh, who are new, welcome. Um, you may be like, what is EFF Austin? Well, you might gather from the name, we're an Austin-based digital civil liberties organization. We're closely affiliated with Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is based in San Francisco and is um, the nation's foremost digital civil liberties advocacy group. You can kind of think of them as the ACLU for the internet and emerging technologies. They help fight for things like net neutrality, end-to-end uh, -end encryption, protecting Section 230 of the CDA, and um, also various um, issues related to surveillance, which will be uh, the topic of our uh, talk tonight. Um, and so I'm just also going to say real quick that as far as um, moderation for the meeting goes, um, you either can message me or David, your host, or, or Evan, your host as well, if you have a question at any point, or you can raise your hand and I can unmute you and you can ask your question directly. Um, and also, I will say that um, I'm having some slight sound technical difficulties that I've mostly resolved tonight. I blame it on um, I am a recent full my uh i've recently fully migrated my workflow over to linux and i'm dealing with a few driver issues probably haha -ha. so um yeah so we're going um so basically um so yeah that's a little bit about eff austin and eff um as i said we um were a member of what's known as the efa or the electronic frontier alliance which is a network of affiliate digital civil liberties groups all throughout the United States. And in fact, our speaker, Evan, is with STOP, um, the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project based out of New York City. And they are also a member of the EFA. And they do really amazing work that I'll let Evan tell you more about. Um, also, just going to give you a few more quick brief announcements here. Uh, for those of you who are going to be around Austin for South by Southwest, well, we are happy to announce that after a couple of years of no South by Southwest presence, uh, basically ever since COVID happened, um, we are tentatively uh, stepping our toes into the water again with an in-person event. We're going to be having a free no badge required meetup next Tuesday at 3 p.m. at the downtown Austin Public Library on the patio of the Cookbook Cafe there. They, don't worry, they have a full bar. <laughs> and we're basically going to just be giving a space, if you are in the area for South by Southwest, to meet up with like-minded digital civil liberties folks. No badge required, just come hang out and uh, meet people. I believe EFF's told me there's gonna be a few people from EFF in town, so should be able to meet some of them there. Um, we're also like celebrating a uh, recent redesign of our website, which we just launched. So the meetups kind of doubling as that. So yeah, you should totally come out if you're free. I will include details to the event in the chat here in just a moment. Um, and yeah. As far as also what we do in general, we usually have monthly meetups the second Tuesday of every month at 7 p.m. Um, our one in April is gonna be with our former board member, Ed Cavazos, who's a major uh, tech lawyer here in Austin. It's gonna be giving us a presentation on cyber law. <laughs> so from a title like that, you know, you can't miss it. Um, so yeah, in addition, we the main thing we do is our monthly meetups where we talk on a variety of digital civil liberties topics that we also occasionally do uh, political advocacy work, both at the Austin level and at the Texas Ledge. Um, we've also been known to throw occasional cool parties, though those have been less frequent uh, ever since COVID. Um, but yeah, and also the April meetup has the distinction of being our first in-person meetup in quite a while. So we are very excited to start having some in-person stuff again. So I think, I think that is enough for me. I'm going to introduce our speaker, Evan, and let him get going here. So our speaker this month is Evan Inzer. He's an Austin I Bay marriage, and he's a legal fellow at the Surveillance Technology Oversight Project, which is a New York-based nonprofit advocate 
advocating at the state and local levels. A recent graduate of Berkeley Law, he previously externed with the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau on the privacy work stream, was an advanced clinical student in Berkeley's Technology Policy Clinic and volunteered with Berkeley's Digital Rights Project. He also worked as a summer clerk for affordable housing nonprofits and was a team leader for Berkeley Law's Animal Law Project. Before law school, he worked in homeless services and local music. Outside of law and policy, Evan loves competitive pickleball and social entrepreneurship. So, um, yeah, I wanted to have somebody from STOP come and talk to us because they really do a lot of amazing work on um, surveillance issues in this country. There's been a lot of attention on federal and international surveillance um, in, ever since you know the revelations that uh, Edward Snowden gave us almost a decade ago at this point of how the NSA was warrantlessly spying on uh, millions of Americans and collecting their personal data. That being said, well, that's gotten the lion's share of the attention. Some of the government's worst behavior happens closer to home, and not many people are advocating on these local surveillance issues. And it turns out STOP is one of the best groups in the country at advocating on these local issues. And so I thought it'd be great to have Evan come and talk to us a little bit about STOP's work and how you can fight surveillance at the local level. So without further ado, take it away, Evan. Thank you so much. That was a really incredible introduction. Um, I'm not sure how much better I could have done with it. Um, I'm going to get my screen share up, and I think I'm going to possibly leave it just like this, so I can keep seeing the uh, all the video on the sidelines. Let's see. Okay, I can keep seeing everybody if I do the the full presentation. So, like Kevin said, um, I'm Evan. I'm uh, a Texan by marriage. I'm coming at you today from McDade, Texas, which is about, about 40 minutes from Austin. I'm out on the family ranch. Um, I apologize if there are any issues with any lag for my audio um, or anything like that. If it gets really bad, I can try doing some um, you, you sound a different great. Way to internet. And, and sounds I, great. And I was going to say uh, McDade until I heard Family Ranch. I was going to guess you were out at the Ren Fair out there. Oh, yes. The Ren Fair is also happening this uh, starting this week. It's a lot of fun, Sherwood Forest Fair. You should go if you're in the area sometime. Mm -hmm. a lot of fun. You should go to the Ren Fair. Um, I would love if we could make this a little bit interactive today. I know that can be um, a bit difficult with the security permissions on Zoom but just let Kevin or one of the other hosts know if you have a question or a comment, um, I would love to hear them as we go along. Um, if not, there will be some time towards the end to, to discuss some things. And I'm hoping that we could actually um, potentially take some of what we talk about tonight and start applying them to different issues that we're seeing in Austin or more broadly around Texas. Um, so like Kevin said, STOP's a community-based civil rights and privacy organization that litigates and advocates to protect the interests of um, all sorts of marginalized people. Um, it could be BIPOC, BIPOC populations, um, LGBTQ plus individuals, people seeking abortions. Unfortunately, we're seeing a lot more surveillance in that space right now, um, or different religious minorities, um, especially the, the Muslim community in New York. Um, Speaking about New York, we do mostly work in um, New York State at the city and state level, but we also support a lot of like-minded groups around the country. Um, like Kevin said, I'm going to be talking about how state and local surveillance um, is an unprecedented danger to our civil rights and civil liberties. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what STOP does um, and, dis and discuss how we can apply those strategies to different advocacy work around the country. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion about federal surveillance over the last couple of decades. We all know about whistleblowers like Edward Snowden and more recently Senator Wyden, who revealed that agencies like uh, the NSA and CIA are collecting and analyzing an unprecedented amount of data um, about Americans. Often this is completely indiscriminate. They are monitoring our internet traffic and phone data in bulk. Um, way too often, this um, data is very explicitly going to target um, BIPOC communities and other minorities. Um, back in the day, one Bush advisor even said this is going to be necessary to pay increased surveillance. Um, and I think most of us 
probably have disagreeing political positions on some things, but I think we can all agree that um, religious liberty um, is something that's worth protecting. So before going on much more, I think it's a little bit necessary to talk about how federalism works. Um, and this is a concept that designates that certain responsibilities belong to the federal government and others belong to states and localities. Um, so the federal government includes things like the president, Congress, et cetera. And in, under the constitution, they're only allowed to take on certain activities. Um, the rest of the power is left to states. And states can act much more broadly under something called the police power. Basically, if it's reasonably in the public interest, um, there's a lot better chance that states are gonna be able to take that action than the federal government. Um, even though there are different governments, often the state and local and federal government will share a lot of information together. Um, even so, a lot of what, what happens in our daily lives is up to the states. It can differ based on where you live, but in Texas, city, the state loves to interfere with what cities do. Um, you might remember that recently Austin was uh, considering uh, defunding the police, and then the state said, um, if any city does that, we're going to cut their funding. So the state has a lot to, of say over what cities do, but cities can actually take a lot of action on their own. And so while they would have been giving up a lot of funding, um, actually the city could have taken that action to, to cut the police budget. Um, because state and local governments have so much authority to act on their own, they can also make a lot of really bad decisions about surveillance technology. And I feel like I've covered uh, a good amount of material there, and I'd love to see if there are any questions to, to answer. If there's not much, we can go on. And so while I live in Texas, my work is very New York centric because STOP is based there. So I'm gonna start there. Um, New York is one of the most heavily surveilled states in the country, and it has a really bad history of targeting BIPOC and other minority communities. Um, for decades, the New York Police Department worked with the CIA to investigate and surveil Muslim communities. They watched places of worship like mosques, different religious centers and targeted charitable leaders for increased surveillance. There was one story where a undercover informant reached out to an organizer on Facebook, added him as a friend, um, pretended to ask for religious advice and other just sort of life advice, developed a relationship, and then years later uh, confessed, confessed that he was a NYPD informant who was uh, keeping tabs on him for the police. Um, and really terribly, there was just absolutely no reason to surveil um, this individual or these communities. They were just watching people indiscriminately. They had no suspicion that they were doing anything wrong. It was just simply because of their religion and their national origin. Uh, the police just thought that they might find something relevant if they kept uh, closer tabs on these people. I would say that that is racism and that's targeting a specific religious group just for their exercise of religion. And this program led to absolutely no actionable information on its own. Um, after decades, the NYPD shut it down um, because it was ineffective. Um, I'm, unless there's any questions about that, I'm gonna move on to some other issues that we're seeing in New York. I'll just say that I think I've finally resolved my audio issues, so I will hopefully be able to be a more attentive moderator now. <laughs> I see that uh, Sharon raised her hand. Uh, yeah, let me, um, you, I think it's because you have permission to unmute her, but I can do it if you Yeah, want. you just did, you just okay. did it. I, I could okay. not do it. Okay. Um, well, thank you. I, I just wondering, I, I was just wondering if you could explain a little bit more what the state was anticipating it would get out of that, that it did not get, that therefore prompted them to drop the program, Is I, if I'm understanding what you just said. Yeah, so what the state was looking for was um, tips about terrorism, um, hence surveilling um, Muslim communities more closely than others. 
um, and it didn't lead to any actionable information. So eventually they, they shut down the program just because it wasn't working. And um, I guess just, um, as I said, I missed a bit of what you were saying while I was monkeying with the audio, but I heard enough to basically just, I think I'll just give some context for our listeners here in Austin that we actually, um, we've had some similar uh, racial profiling and surveillance here in Austin that was actually revealed by uh, the uh, the blue leaks a while back where all those police department files were leaked. And actually the Austin Chronicle did a very uh, good series of reporting on blue leaks with reporter John Anderson, uh, who we actually had at a panel several months back. But um, yeah, one thing that came out in that is that our police department was um, blatantly uh, surveilling people purely because of their religion, race, or ethnicity. There were people who they were, there was one man in particular who was on um, Cap Metro, our bus system, who they were surveilling him simply because he had recently started taking to wearing uh, traditional Islamic garb with no other reason for the surveillance. So Austin's having this problem as well, if you are not aware. <laughs> it's great to hear about some of those specifics about what's happening in Austin. Um, you know, a, a lot of my work just focuses on other states, so I don't get all of that local context. Yeah, I will. Uh, I will share some links to blue links uh, leaks in the chat and the reporting the Chronicle did on it, both for Evan and for anybody here in Austin who wants to learn about these problems in our own city. <laughs> um. So, on a similar topic, um, still focusing on New York. Um, Amnesty International is a, you know, very well-known international human rights organization, and they've been working on a um, program to map all the surveillance cameras in different parts of the world. So they recently came out with a report that had some very disturbing research. It found that there are thousands of government surveillance cameras in every part of New York City. Um, and even worse, um, we know that New York City, City has facial recognition software and not a lot of regulations about when to use it. Um, this amounts to it being almost impossible to go anywhere in New York City without getting caught on camera. And then if they want to, they can go back and identify you using the facial recognition technology. Um, I always say this is really problematic because it's pretty easy to hide your ID in your wallet, or if you really need to, you can even change your driver's license number, but it's a lot harder to hide your face or to get plastic surgery to change the way you look, making you uh, incapable of being identified by, by facial recognition. I have a quick question I'm prompted to ask, which is with mm -hmm. that level of surveillance, as you said, literally thousands of cameras almost anywhere you could go in the city, obviously some of those cameras are going to catch people's private windows in their apartments. Um, are there any rules around if one of these cameras catches footage of somebody's private space? I mean, is is the assumption that, oh, well, you were, even though you were home, you were in front of your window, you have no expectation of privacy. So I don't have any examples of this, um, this exact situation, but there is something in con law called the um, like plain view doctrine. And that basically means if you're doing something that can be in the public view, you have no reasonable expectation of privacy to it. So you could apply that to cameras and say, oh, you were doing this in your window and this camera happened to see that you were there taking this action. Like maybe you were smoking some weed, but we saw you doing that through your window. Um, and then that, that wouldn't be um, suppressed or, or excluded under the constitution. Um, I'm sure we have some some very smart people on on the call that um, maybe also know about this, and I'd be happy to hear what they think about that. Yeah, at any point, anybody has a question wants to chime in, by all means. Uh, Evan is definitely one of our speakers who wants to chat with you, so so don't be shy. <laughs> okay. Um, as Kevin said earlier, this is not just an issue that's in New York. Police departments all around the country are getting surveillance orders from judges to let them search all internet data. One version of this is called a geofence warrant. This is when police get a list of every cell phone that happened to be in a defined geographic range at a certain time. Um, so I'm a big fan of pickleball, as you heard in my intro. 
So maybe I'm playing pickleball over in Pan Am Park in East Austin, and the police um, just want to get a geofence warrant to see everybody who was in the area at that time. They might just be looking for one phone number, but they're also going to see that I was there. And I, another version of this is called a keyword warrant. Um, I recently got engaged, so I was doing some shopping for rings. Um, maybe the police also got a warrant that um, gave them everybody who searched for a specific keyword in a, in a certain period of time. And so I may have just been in that area and searched that keyword and ended up on a list. And there might not be very much evidence against me other than that. Um, like, let's say somebody robbed a jewelry store at the same time, and they think, hey, this guy was in the area looking up something that was related. Let's go ask him some questions. Um, unfortunately, there's just nothing to stop them from doing that um, if they already have this information. I have uh, Nick here in the chat even sharing that there was a man in Arizona who was falsely arrested on a geofence warrant and lost his job. I don't have there's more details beyond that, but yes. <laughs> there's been all sorts of terrible things that have happened because of location data, um, even outside of. Uh, oh, and I'm going to share with everybody. I've just been given the news story. So. Yeah, that sounds great. I would love to read that. We've seen lots of examples of people losing their jobs based on um, location data, even more broadly than geofence warrants. Um, sometimes private investigators will. Uh, grab data from data brokers they can just buy it for you know actually not very much money um, there was a story where um, sort of an, an activist organization that was uh, anti-gay rights um, obtained some data that showed that a man was visiting uh, gay clubs um, made that data public and then forced him to resign from his job um, so there can be a lot of problems with this even even beyond the police context And we've already been talking about that this happens all around the country, including Austin. Um, I, have a, uh, I have a question here. Uh, yeah. Is the threshold for getting these warrants from judges different than an individualized warrant for user data? No, it's, it's not any different. Um, it's the same requirements. It just gives you the information about a, a lot more people. Um, it's really problematic because of um, Usually you need, you need individualized suspicion to get a warrant. Um, but for some reason, a lot of judges are, are granting these warrants anyway. Um, there's actually a big effort right now to argue that these kinds of warrants are unconstitutional. And we're, we're actually seeing some, some good progress on that front of uh, judges siding with, with activists to, um, to, to rule them unconstitutional. Um, and we have an audience member who wants to know, uh, how many of these warrants are being granted? I don't have those numbers in front of me right now, but it's a lot more than you would expect. Um, it's enough that this is actually getting, getting challenged in court. I'm being told there's at least hundreds of them. by there, there, are, there are many, many of them. <laughs> and I also, uh, the Arizona case, for those who didn't click the link, the summary basically is the dude gave his stepdad an old Android phone, but never signed out of the account. His stepdad went and killed somebody, and it got traced back to the innocent man because his data was still in the phone, his account, and he was signed in. That's really horrible. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. So going back to some of these different surveillance problems we're seeing, it's you might have heard um, about a year ago, maybe it was a little longer now, but the Austin City Council um, passed an ordinance that limited facial recognition. Um, but unfortunately, that's not the only problem that, that Austin has to deal with when it comes to surveillance. Um, APD has a huge surveillance network that's similar to the, the one uh, that NYPD owns. Um, a nonprofit called Just Futures Law wrote a great report on this in 2020. According to the report, APD has $58 million um, in technology and surveillance contracts. They have the technology that mines for metadata, stores video, shares information, predicts where future crimes will occur and when, automatically scans license plates, 
um, takes all that data and catalogs it into a um, environment where it's usable for humans and they monitor social media in bulk. Um, also, the while Austin has an ordinance that limits facial recognition, the state government, um, including the Department of Public Safety, um, does use facial recognition and does share that information with the federal government. Um, this is problematic in a lot of ways. Um, for instance, ICE uh, will often use facial recognition and biometric data to target people for deportation. And, and I guess, Evan, um, do you know what the um, current extent of the city's ordinance is? Because I was following that pretty closely. I know that they're not in the list of uh, cities that are in full compliance with the EFF's about face campaign of a complete ban of all city entities that are public entities using facial recognition. Um, do you know the scope of the uh, city ordinance on this? I was looking at this pretty recently. I don't remember exactly, but I do think it applies to, to law enforcement. So I, I believe it's a law enforcement, um, at least oh. moratorium on, on facial recognition. Okay, interesting. If, if you find more details, share that with me, because I had been pretty informed on the current state of the law there, but it sounds like I may be a little out of date. <laughs> I, I can just read the ordinance um, and send that to you. Absolutely, that sounds. I, I, I'm not sure it applies to the entire city, but I, I do. I do believe it applies to, to law enforcement. Um, I'm and I have one audience member. Uh, oh, actually, I'm. Yeah, I have Dr. Sturber here saying that Austin doesn't necessarily have an ordinance. We have uh, guidance documents. Yes, I think it was. I think it's called a resolution. Okay. Is that right? Okay, so okay, so it may not be legally binding. It may just be more a suggestion. <laughs> that very well might be true. I'm I'm not too sure about that. Yeah, because as I said, at least I know, at least at the beginning of COVID, we had no such rule. Um, that may have changed. I'll have to look into it. I think I think it got passed sort of um, during COVID. Um, I believe it was after the the Black Lives Matter protests. Ah, uh, that, that might explain how I might have missed it. Um, yeah, <laughs> but I'll have to look more into it. But thank you for letting me know. So STOP pushes back against this sort of surveillance activity in a number of different ways. Um, one of the big projects right now is supporting a coalition called Gangs. Um, that coalition is trying to pass a law that would eliminate a really terrible NYPD database. Um, this database collects um, information about hundreds of thousands of people. Most of them are black, black and Latinx, and many of them are children. Um, NYPD adds people to this database when it suspects they're members of a gang or crew. Um, but the problem is that these terms are very broad. Um, and according to the rules, these groups don't actually need to carry out any criminal activity to meet the definition of a, of a, a gang or a crew. Um, what's even worse is that a lot of people are added to this database just because of who they know, where they spend time, or what colors they wear. So if you live in a poor neighborhood that has some gang activity, there's a pretty good chance that you know somebody who's already in the database. You might spend some time at a 7-Eleven where NYPD suspects that there might be some gang activity. And you might occasionally wear some colors that NYPD doesn't like. Um, that's enough to land you in, in this database, which then tags you for increased surveillance. Um, once again, it's not just New York that has these sorts of databases. Um, we've seen similar ones in Chicago. LA has something similar. I don't know if there's anything in, in Austin that, that does this, but I wouldn't be surprised if there is. Uh, does anybody know about that? Um, yeah, let's see. Um, I will say that, um, um, so I have, I have one person saying this space for a sec. Uh, so what, what is the exact question again about? So there's something in New York that we call a gang database and a lot of people will get added to it, um, because they are like associated with some people that NYPD thinks are suspicious, or maybe they spend some time in areas where, maybe there's some drug transactions or maybe they just have like a fashion sense that the police think is suspicious um and this happens in a lot of different cities 
Um, but I'm just wondering if, if anybody knows if it happens in Austin. Um, well, I will say from some uh, chat message I got here, I we have somebody in the audience who I don't necessarily want to out them unless they volunteer, but um, somebody who might very well know, sounds like they potentially know quite a bit about APD stuff, then I'm certainly planning to follow up with them after this meeting, but I don't want to uh, out them unless they volunteer, they directly know. <laughs> But um, I mean, I'll say I don't unfortunately know specifically, I will, I will say here in Austin, you know, it is very difficult to research this stuff. The things I know personally about are some of these surveillance activities that um, grassroots leadership put out in that report they did. I know there's definitely some surveillance of uh, minority communities here in Austin. I know there also is, um, as I said, as part of Blue Reeks, there's collaboration with our local fusion center, with, with ORIC, basically. I know there's data pipelines going on there. Um, yeah, I don't know specifically about if there's essentially a known associates gang database. I want to say that I think the answer is yes, but I'd have to ask my friends in the Austin Justice Coalition who focus specifically on these racial justice issues. I'm sure the answer is almost definitely yes, but I just don't know the program off the top of my tongue. I would not be surprised if, if there is one. I'd almost be more surprised if there isn't. Same. And I mean, a lot of it is we suspect things, but it's very hard to know specifics, particularly because if you, like me, have ever done a deep dive into APD purchase orders, it's delightfully vague. They'll say things like, spent $30,000 on software, and they won't say what software. So there's a very shocking lack of transparency on a lot of this stuff. Yeah, unfortunately, you, you, a lot of times you won't learn about these things until there's a big controversy uh, around it. I have had uh, the person who I thought might be knowledgeable did just volunteer some information that I will share that there is um, there's a program that's based on the state program. It's called SARS or suspicious activity reports, basically. So that that's definitely going on. That's good to know. I, I know that there are some. Um, sorts of mechanisms for suspicious activity reports that are not exactly the same as the gang database. Um, there's one for federal financial crimes that just more flags you for, for more review, um, but that's not necessarily the same as the, um, the gang database, but it, it's the same sort of idea. Um, another thing that we're working on at STOP um, we're working with Amnesty International on a campaign to ban facial recognition in New York State. Um, to do this, we've started a, a coalition group of um, different nonprofits and community leaders from around the state. Um, as a group, we've written different pieces of state and local legislation. Right now, we're really focused on the city level and we're pushing on bills that would um, ban fa facial recognition under um, like different industries. So one would be police use, another might be housing, um, stuff like that. Um, we're working together with lawmakers to introduce these bills in the city council. And then we're going to build um, public awareness through doing different trainings and events um, to build support for the bills and educate about the issue. We also do a lot of research and advocate in the media. Um, we have a, a very robust but small communications team. And we have a dedicated research team uh, we write reports, memos, op-eds, and testimony on various subjects like AI bias and, of course, facial recognition and gang database. Um, basically, anything that's, that's important to our community partners, we'll, we'll, do, we'll research and write about. One recent example um, is that we did an analy analysis of law enforcement investigations that were related to the January 6th riot at the federal capitol. Um, we looked to see if how many instances of facial recognition um, contributed to the current um, guilty pleas. And what we found was that there was only about three cases where facial recognition played a part um, in the arrest and ultimate um, conviction of, of that person. So we found that most, a large, large, large majority of the convictions, the major piece of evidence was just simply a tip or that they posted pictures of themselves in the Capitol on social media. Um, ultimately, facial recognition was, was very irrelevant to, um, to, those, to those law enforcement efforts. Um, when Good we afternoon. presented this, 
that was my, I was just going to say, yeah, that was my understanding as well. I remember that initially when the whole Capitol thing happened, you had a uh, depressing number of Democrats who should know better talking about like needing encryption backdoors. And I was like, I don't know. They all publicly outed themselves on social media. They weren't hiding what they were up to. Yes, that's exactly what we found, um, that, that you did not need any sort of um, – new investigatory tools to to convict these people um, who were in the Capitol. Um, that, that report that we published got a lot of media attention and some other organizations picked up the story. Um, another uh, even more recent example, um, you might remember that recently the IRS was going to institute um, like facial identification um, when you try to log into their systems. Now that was um, on my radar. I I was uh, raging about that one. <laughs> yeah, so so were we. Um, so we wrote some op eds about this, um, joined some sign on letters, and did some advocacy about it. It got a lot of attention. Um, our executive director was doing pretty much nonstop media appearances um, about the IRS and facial recognition for about a week or two, um, and eventually. I, I can't say stop gets all the credit for this. We definitely don't uh, fight for the future. And a lot of other organizations um, did a lot of advocacy on this. But eventually the IRS did decide to, to not go forward with that plan for facial recognition. Um, unfortunately, there's still a lot of government agencies at the federal and state and local level that are still using face identification. Uh, for instance, in, in New York, um, this is still used for a lot of unemployment and uh, public benefits claims. And a, a huge problem is we all know how inaccurate facial recognition can be. And when it's not accurate, you, you bring this huge roadblock in the way of people getting their public benefits after they're laid off. And when New York originally put this, um, this system in place was right at the height of the COVID pandemic when people were losing their jobs faster than ever before. And it, it just doesn't make any sense to put these um, inaccurate and slow roadblocks in front of people when they're trying to get their benefits. So uh, while the IRS um, is great, that they're walking that, that plan back, there's, there's still a long way to go on this. And Evan, I'm curious if you have any knowledge of this that, you know, and as you said, absolutely right, they find the IRS is walking it back, but there's over, I think I read like over 28 states still contract with ID.me for identity verification services, including things like facial recognition. And I, ever since I've seen this shady third party company having all of these government contracts, I mean, I'm wondering if you guys know your research, is there like evidence of like, corruption essentially like i keep thinking there's got to be like you know whoever owns that company is friends with some powerful people because i'm just like how the hell has this third party company whose privacy policy for their data is abysmal i read it they give themselves so many loopholes about what they can do with your data i'm just like how did they get all these cushy contracts yeah we we haven't come any across anything like that um but i mean how does any government procurement work uh, mm -hmm. You know somebody, you know somebody, and, and you get in there. Um, I like what you said about their privacy policy, because I, I think almost every privacy policy is almost meaningless. You know, a, a company can say that, oh, we really value your privacy and we'll never do X, Y, and Z with your data. But then you read the privacy policy and it's like, okay, but these terms do allow you to still do anything you want with the data. Um, and we're just relying on your goodwill to, to not do it rather than having any sort of um, protection in the terms of service or the contract. And that that is entirely true with, with IDME. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, I just recall, now I think they did with all the public outrage tighten the policy a bit, but I remember when I initially read it, like this one was like comically bad because it was basically like, yeah, we're not a government agency, we're a private company. And basically it was like, we won't give your data to other people except in situations where and then it was like it was like so ambiguous that like it could be spun as any vague business purpose or like aiding law enforcement in any capacity not even with a criminal investigation mm -hmm. it was like comically broad you know what's almost 
even worse than just having that language in the privacy policies is that in a lot of the proposed um, consumer privacy statutes that we're seeing introduced in you know, every state, um, a lot of them have similar language, especially when it comes to law enforcement. Um, it's just a third rail that, that nobody wants to touch. Um, and even you know, some of the best um, you know, privacy protective laws in, in the country, which you know, by, by my standards are still not very good, um, there's just entire carve outs for aiding law enforcement inquiries. Um, you know, no specifics about really what that means, no requirements for a legal order or anything like that. Just um, if law enforcement asks and they're, they have an inquiry, then uh, the company can help them under, under the state law. Um, so in addition to all the work that STOP's doing in New York and, you know, the little federal work that we do, um, we're also supporting coalitions from around the country. Um, a lot of organizations will reach out to us asking us to support or, or oppose a specific law in their state. Um, and we are usually happy to do that. Um, a recent example is that um, an organization reached out to us to do a comment for, about facial recognition in Maryland. Um, they have a new biometric privacy law um, that the legislature is considering. And so we submitted some, some material in support of that. Um, we'll also sign on to letters or um, other writings that other organizations do. Um, one example of this is that there was a, um, a letter that was sent around that was criticizing some irresponsible, irresponsible business practices at Facebook. Um, and we were, we were happy to sign on to that. So now we're moving on to some of the um, real strategies that STOP uses for advocacy. Um, and really, based on what I've already said, it's, it's very simple. All we do is we engage with the community, we identify and comment on local issues, and we support groups that share our values. So the first thing we do is build relationships within the community. Um, and I think this is a really great place for EFF Austin um, to get involved with these things um, as a group of people that are um, heavily involved with, with privacy and are knowledgeable about civil liberties and civil rights, you can be great representatives um, for the anti-surveillance cause or any other issues you might care about. Um, the way this could look would be getting involved with conversations with people in the community, um, people who are the most directly impacted by government surveillance, um, hearing about their perspectives and their priorities and discussing um, how surveillance is a part of that. Maybe if, if they don't quite understand how they got identified um, in a certain uh, case, or um, if they got a random friend request on Facebook that maybe was an undercover police officer, like what happened in New York, um, you can sort of explain how these, these different things um, are actually um, affecting their, their daily life. The other thing this could look like is trainings. Um, STOP does a, a lot of trainings. Um, what we like to do is present things in a narrative form. Um, and these narratives are always informed by real world examples. We think a lot of these harms can be very abstract to a lot of people, and it really helps to center them um, within daily experience. The other thing that STOP does that uh, EFF Austin could also do, or you could do in your personal life, is um, identifying and commenting on local issues. You can often learn about a lot of these things by um, listening to the community members through that outreach you do and getting involved with, with different parts of, um, with different grassroots efforts around the city. Um, you can read local ordinances and local news. I know Kevin was saying he went through APD's procurement contracts, and I think that's a great way to learn about issues, however, might, however vague they might be. Um, if anything, you can just say, hey, I, I need to know more about this, and you can submit some uh, freedom of information requests to the, to the government to try to get more information. And, and by the way, um, I meant to say, just a second ago, Evan, that, um, you know, absolutely, um, 
you know, this is an issue that we have tried to do some advocacy on, but, you know, I, I really think it's just great that you are in the Austin area. And I think you said you're going to be at our meetup next week. I will definitely be chatting with you about how we can leverage your knowledge to try to be more effective in this space in Austin. Cause uh, I, uh, I've definitely done what I can over the years, but you guys are clearly the expert on actually making some change in this space. We throw good meetups and parties. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's the first part, right? That's getting involved with your community, having the meetups and parties where you learn about things and get people involved. Yeah, COVID's made it hard to do a lot of that. These yeah. have been our best thing for a while. So hopefully we can start rebuilding that community here. But yes, um, we I'm very happy that we have somebody with your knowledge that we can potentially start leveraging here. Go ahead, Sharon. Um, um, I know the city of New York under the de Blasio administration issued a couple of pretty lengthy reports on um, how they were going to try to mobilize community engagement. A guy named Neil Perrick was intimately involved in that. He left with the de Blasio administration. But I was wondering what your interactions with that group were. And they were very keen to kind of use a, a, a more research and, and com, kind of community information based effort to try to figure out how to, um, how to, if not enact an ordinance, at least come up with some guidance rules. Um, if, if, are you talking about the plan to put some community oversight over acquiring yes, surveillance products? Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so stop has been very involved in that effort in mm -hmm. New York. Um, I wasn't going to talk about that much because during the last meetup, we had Nash from, um, electronic frontier foundation, and this is exactly the topic he was talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, but yes, we, we've been very involved in that, in that effort around the, uh, the CCOPS surveillance ordinance. I think those are, are very good plans. Um, while they don't go far enough, um, you know, STOP really thinks that there should be an entire ban on a lot of these technologies, including facial recognition, geofence warrants, keyword warrants. Um, it is a great start to give people um, more control over um, procurement of, of these uh, technologies. Um, it's, it's ridiculous how much leeway we give to the, the police department to just buy anything they want to uh, without legislative oversight. But there has been a, a big effort in New York around that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, and this sort of commenting on local issues doesn't always need to be legislative advocacy. Um, I mentioned that STOP does a lot of op-eds and blog posts and things like that, just about the issues that are going on in the community. Um, our executive director, Albert, has written literally hundreds of op-eds um, with all sorts of organizations. So if you can find one of these issues that's timely and really relevant in your community, just write a piece about it um, and find a reporter at a local newspaper and say, hey, I have this story and an opinion about this um, this local issue that's going on. Um, would you be interested in running it on your website or the paper? Um, and a lot of times they, they will be. And I'm, I'm curious, you know, as you said, Al Albert is really like, you know, one of, one of our nation's experts in kind of building a groundswell around this stuff. What, are, what have Albert and you and Stop found are like the effective ways to essentially you know, shift the public conversation and build a, a groundswell towards, um, you know, actually getting these technologies regulated. Because I find one of the biggest things you always, when trying to be an activist on this stuff, run into is just that a lot of the public is shockingly just ambivalent about this stuff. They're like, well, yeah, I hear you, but how much harm is it really doing? And it makes me feel safe, you know? Like, what have you guys found is the real way to like build that community demand for reform and change because obviously if it's just us digital civil liberties geeks sounding the alarm you know we're not going to be able to change things by ourselves i think it really comes down to 
expanding beyond your close group of, of people who are already interested in the same thing as you are, um, but taking those topics to other people. Um, you know, we would never be able to ban facial recognition in, in housing without the support of, um, you know, tenants' rights activists and other tenant, group, and tenant groups. Um, another big part of this is not focusing so much on the privacy harms or the concerns about surveillance and thinking more about what are the real effects that you will feel in your life because of this technology? Um, are you more likely to go to jail because of this? Is it perpetuating racism? Um, so focusing on topics that people already care about rather than um, privacy or, or more abstract harms like that. Um, and it's really key to, to be a part of a coalition um, and bring people together um, other than, rather than just going it alone. Um, I think it's more effective to reach out to other groups that are already established um, to work together on something um, more so than really trying to, to go it alone and find individual people who, who might be interested in um, working with you on something at first. And okay, here's, here's a follow up for you. Um, so, you know, I do know a number of other activist groups here in Austin. Um, and, you know, sir, and I mean, and I know some of them because, well, I care about their issues, you know, um, racial justice, for instance. But, um, but I've often found that it can be difficult um, sometimes maybe with other activist groups where you do think there's a shared interest on some of these issues, not necessarily that they don't agree it's important or don't care, but obviously they have their priorities and the things they're working on. And so I've found it can be tricky to basically, you know, most activists are not getting paid a lot of money and are frankly doing it as a labor of love. It can be very hard mm -hmm. when everybody's got very limited time to get somebody to go, hey, I know you primarily focus on this, but take your limited time and focus on this narrower issue that we overlap with you on. I, you know, it's just like I'm aware that you know it's a big ask, and so I don't know, like, if Saab has specific thoughts about how you really build those activist networks of of shared activist affinity groups. Well, I think in a case like that, I think you're absolutely right that there are just time constraints that make it hard to to do a lot of this. Um, but when there's a group that already has their priorities and is already working on something, you can bring that aspect of, of privacy and surveillance and say, this is how this fits into what you're already working on. Um, so let's say, if do you care about um, immigration and immigrants and immigrants' rights? You don't want people to get deported. You can say, well, um, data sharing and facial recognition plays a big part in um, ICE identifying people and then deporting them. So in this advocacy you're doing around this, why don't we also talk about um, how we need to ban facial recognition in, in the state of Texas? Um, I, I don't know how, how realistic that idea is, but rather than trying to bring people to your cause, just bring your existing expertise to, to their cause. Gotcha. I gotcha. think I think that actually segues very well into the next thing I wanted to mention, that you can support local groups that share your values. Um, I've already mentioned that you can sign on to other groups' letters and their writing. Um, and in that case, you, you don't even need to do any writing yourself. Or if they have something that they're working on and you want to add a, a sentence or two about surveillance or privacy or any other um, tech and civil liberties issue, um, you can just ask them to edit it and add it in there, and they might be happy to, to have your input on that. Um, other things you can do is just donate money. We've already talked about how activists don't make a ton of money. Um, so you could do a, a fundraiser and donate it to a group that you care about um, that maybe is also working on these surveillance or privacy issues or something else that you care about. Volunteering is also really important. Um, one of the biggest constraints like we've been talking about is just time and manpower. And so if you want to, if there's already a group that's working on something that you care about, you can just volunteer with them. 
it's likely that they already have priorities and lots of things that you can work on. Right, right. And mm -hmm. by, by the way, I, um, I'm going to do a quick uh, mod moment here based on a comment left to me by somebody who I would address them directly, but unfortunately they are not in the meeting anymore. Um, so a little clarification maybe for some people who are like, don't understand why um, I'm asking people to uh, raise their hand if they want to be unmuted is we had a very bad Zoom bombing incident about a year ago. Um, it nearly completely ruined one of our speakers meetups. It was really bad. <laughs> and so believe me, I don't like having to have any of these permissions for the first whole year we did this. I basically let people unmute themselves. I let them do whatever they wanted. Um, I had to lock it down after that incident. So it's not that I'm trying to limit the conversation. I just want to make that clear. It's just, it really was quite bad. And I, you know, have to take some precautions to respect our speakers and audience so that they're not exposed to very offensive sounds and imagery. Um, so that, but that being said, I, as I've emphasized, I hope, and I'm going to just reiterate it because apparently this audience member who left didn't fully understand this, but like, please do raise your hand. I will unmute you. I just have to have some limits on just letting people do whatever they want. It's not my desire, but it um, it seriously was was bad the one time it happened. So if anybody is upset with this, believe me, I don't like it either. And all you need to do is message me or raise your hand and I will unmute you. So um, sorry for the person who left who apparently did not quite understand, but I figured I would re-explain to people. <laughs> um. And on that note, I would love um, lots of engagement. Um, this next thing I wanted to talk about is actually just ideas about what we could do as um, members of this EFF Austin community and people in Texas. Um, I do know it can be hard with the security controls, um, but I would love some participation about um, different ideas for advocacy in Texas, different issues that you care about, different things that we might be able to bring this passion for, for civil and, rights, liberties, and tech to, to the conversation. And then to that point, there are a few people in the conversation here who I know for a fact, I know who they are. So I'm going to go ahead and make them co-hosts just so that they have the ability to chime in whenever they feel like it. That sounds really great. Um, and I, I know maybe we don't all agree about what the most important issues are or what the right ways to address them are. Um, but I think that surveillance should be bipartisan. Um, it's something that affects everybody. Um, the same technology you use to deport people from the country, you can also use to surveil people at, at gun shows who are just trying to exercise their Second Amendment rights. Um, so really, it's, it shouldn't be um, a partisan issue. And I would love to hear what different people um, care about and how they think that we could um, do more with, within our own state. All right, so I've given several people more permissions, so I'm going to say don't be shy. Um, well, actually, you know, because I figure he might have some good thoughts. Uh, hey, David, uh, do you have any uh, thoughts or ideas here? <laughs> I actually do, and I've been trying to figure out how to best word um, my thoughts because they are a bit on the, um, on a, I don't want to say the darker side of things, but on, on a more adult side of things. Um, so, in the queer community, a lot of people use various uh, queer-centric hookup apps, and that's all based on geolocation data things like that. I was actually kind of wondering if you guys have like dealt with anything like that in New York or really anywhere else. I know New York is a has a lot of queer spaces, so I wouldn't be surprised if you guys had seen anything like ridiculous come up with that, but I don't know, it's just something about, you know, all of that information and all the different kinds of media and dialogue that's shared between people that really I feel like puts them at risk and I really don't know exactly how aware of you know many users of those different applications are of how much they may be endangering themselves i think that's a that's a really important issue um you know we've we've seen that um 
that a lot of these apps like Grindr will just sell data directly to the government. Um, and it's, it's really horrible. Um, it's, you know, definitely a problem within the queer community. I, I mentioned earlier that there have been people who have lost their jobs because of where their location data um, revealed that they were. Um, as far as in, this as a privacy issue in New York, New York has really, really bad privacy laws um, and surveillance laws. Um, it's lagging behind a lot of the country on these issues. There are proposals that would, um, you know, lead to data minimization or prohibit um, selling or sharing data without um, consent or enabling, enabling people to opt out of, um, you know, data collection and sharing. But there's not a lot of movement on this um, in the state, to, despite what a problem it is. Um, at, at Stop, we think there should be a ban on, on selling location data. So that's one of the, the big um, the big pushes that, that we would have in mind to, to address that problem. So I, I mean, I absolutely agree that one of the uh, uh, big um, issues is these third party data broker warehouses. I, I guess like one thing I'd be curious about, you know, I agree with Stop that really banning the resale of a lot of that data needs to happen. But I mean, you know, like it's data is, you know, and I, I know this as a programmer, data is very slippery. How do you actually craft those laws in a way where you know you have actually stopped that industry? Because how do you, how do, you do it in a way that it doesn't just all go underground and become a very lucrative black market? Yeah, um, it can definitely be hard to, to write some of these, um, these laws um, you really have to think about what's everything you could possibly want to cover and then try to add it to the to the law. Um, at SOP, we try to write bills that are, are very simple. We don't like to give a lot of these loopholes um, that people might be able to use to just circumvent something to and by using a different technology or a different method. Um, so we we actually haven't written one that would, would ban this sale. Um, but we do try to just, when we do write things, we try to just make it entirely categorical of you just say any look like data that reveals location you can't sell rather than doing a specific methodology of look, creating location data. Um, so I, I guess an example of this would be that um, like banning any sale of data opposed to, um, you know, what we're seeing a lot right now in, in the private sector of people moving away from cookies but moving more towards fingerprinting that basically gets you to the same result, just using a, a different technique. Right. I, I know that like initially privacy advocates were excited about, oh, Chrome is killing off the cookie, but <laughs> it's now, yeah, just because of things like canvas fingerprinting, it's actually, if anything, it's easier to target people. And so these companies get the like, look, we care about your privacy because there aren't third party trackers, but now you don't even need third party trackers to track people anymore. Mm -hmm. um, are there are there any other issues that people would um, think that are worth addressing in, in Texas or any ideas about um, other other ideas about how to address um, location data? I actually did have something else that I wanted to add. Um, so I'm reading this book right now. It's called Building the New Economy, Data is Capital, and it's by several uh, MIT professors. And one of the things that they propose to kind of help better manage public data is actually instituting something called data cooperatives, which would kind of be third party entities that let, let consumers know exactly where their data is being sold and bought and kind of gives them more control over that process or at least more understanding and awareness of it. Um, are you familiar with with this uh, with this concept of a data cooperative, or is this something that's kind of just new, completely new, and out of the minds of these professors? Um, I don't think it's entirely new. I, I haven't heard that word before, um, but it does sound a lot like a lot of this um, sort of like privacy enhancing technology that's coming around right now. Um, you know, there's there's different companies that will let you like 
correct your data or you know share all the data that you'd like to about yourself um, that they then sell and they give you money. So it gives you more transparency into what's going on. Um, some other some states are actually writing this concept into their comprehensive privacy laws. Um, so you'll see proposals. I'm, I'm thinking specifically of one that was rec that recently died in Massachusetts, so it's not going forward. Um, but it would require opt-in before collecting your data, and it would require disclosing all of the um, different third parties that um, that the, the the data collector might share that data with um, or or sell it to. So I I don't think that this is a a new idea. Um, you know, transparency has been around for a long time, but I, I think that's a really uh, nice way of describing it as a data collective. And I think that's a I think that's a pretty viable solution to to increase transparency, um, especially if you couple it with something like opt-in. Um, I think once people understand where their data is going, they're you know of course can be able to make a lot more informed decisions about what products they use or what companies they frequent, um, and if they um, you know, object to where their data is going, they can just refuse to opt in um, rather than having absolutely no choice about it. Yeah, thanks for all that, David. I really appreciate it. And I don't necessarily want to put any particular person on the spot. That being said, I do know that we have uh, somebody from EF Georgia here. So if he feels like volunteering his thoughts to the conversation, I imagine that uh, there might be some uh, interesting stuff that they've been involved in over there in Georgia. But um, I leave it up to him if he wants to chime up. <laughs> can you hear me? This is Scott. Yeah, we can hear you, Scott. OK. Um, yeah, we're going to we're we're not we're in Georgia. We're not in Texas, um, but there's some parallel issues. Um, Atlanta was identified a couple of years ago as one of the, the most heavily surveilled cities in America. And what we have is those license plate readers, Alpers everywhere, 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 everywhere. And the thing about it is nobody seems that seems to be that interested in, in, in the issues. And so getting people engaged has been a uh, struggle. But now um, we've also got the, uh, the gunshot detection system by the name of ShotSpotter. Um, the city evaluated it and decided it wasn't, um, does, it wasn't worth having. They weren't as concerned about the privacy issue, but they just weren't, it, it, they basically thought that they weren't getting their money's worth um, because it's a very expensive solution. And honestly, the, the real accuracy um, the accuracy really isn't that good. It's it's uh, misrepresented as being much better than than it really is, and so we thought that it we thought that we had vanquished it a couple of years ago, and then it came back. We had a private party. We had a couple of private parties that pooled their money together and paid to have the system brought in, and we have a a you know a crime problem and a perception of a crime problem, um, like like many other cities, like like just about everywhere else since since COVID. So. Um, I guess, you know, we have, um, residents on the Southwest side of town that have been asking for it and, and, uh, demanding it and they don't really understand the downside of it. So I think we're at a position where we need to start engaging more publicly and, and educating publicly. And we did have a, um, uh, we did have a talk on it, uh, that was, um, uh, we basically streamed. We did a live stream and, and recorded it on YouTube, uh, and we had some of the activists from from the Chicago area to come out and, and basically introduce the topic for us and talk about it for us. And so that's really good. Uh, what's happening with with some of this uh, technology, especially the gunshot detection, is that the activists in different cities are starting to talk to each other because each region, each city has been a tower unto itself in the past. And now the activists are talking to each other more and coordinating more and even presenting for each other more. And we're sharing data. And so that helps a lot. Um, the other thing I'll say about, about some of the technology, I think we did have a, a maybe it was mentioned here, but <coughs> we noticed that the uh, federal funding has ramped up um, the installation of these systems very quickly. And in, in the past, only the largest cities we're able to really afford the high dollar solutions and high dollar systems. But what we're seeing now is that it's, it's not even from the infrastructure bill, but it's COVID relief money. COVID relief money is, 
being sent into the smaller towns and cities. We know that we just had a, another, we had a system that was supposedly just turned on in Macon, Georgia. And then we found out that they um, were trying to get down into Savannah, Georgia as well, um, where they're facing some resistance. But um, but the, yeah, that we, we do really need uh, federal standards on, you know, what, uh, on, um, you know, what the privacy rights, what our privacy rights should be, and also a chain of evidence, the evidentiary chain of custody rules for electronic surveillance, because um, some of the vendors are, are changing, um, changing evidence to match the story of the police, and that's a problem. And, um, but, you know, even more than that, we really need to address the funding, because I, th I it was said earlier in this call, but the funding um, you know, all this, all this stimulus stuff that we have, the police have no limits on what they can spend. And so instead of buying basic things like, like squad cars and uniforms and, and radios and things like that, hiring and training, they're going out and buying toys and, um, vendors love it, but, um, you know, it, it's a problem for us. There's, there's no stop sign out there. There's no limit. To what it can be spent on so the the problem has has rapidly accelerated because of of the federal funding that's 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 raining down and there and there's no controls on how it can be spent and so we're in touch with the um office of one of our senators um as you know we have we um, managed to elect two democratic senators uh as you may know in, in georgia uh very unusual but uh we're in touch with the office of one of them and we're trying to explain the um the basically the social justice aspect of this and and the the risks and dangers and even the accuracy and whether the government's getting its money's worth if all this money is going in but right now the most pressing problem is how all this stimulus money has um just you know flooded in and there's no controls over how it can be spent and it's causing a lot of smaller cities and towns to be able to buy the systems and they've got the same problems that the, the big cities have, but they have no experience, um, no experience with it. So um, it, it's, it's just, it has just, uh, it was a problem before and this has really accelerated, um, accelerated the, the rate at the pro with which the problem is, is bringing down on us. Yeah, we, we've seen a lot of that all over the country. Um, you know, there was, there was a big, um, widely publicized instance of this in, in Arizona recently. Um, and I think this is a, a really great example of um, just where local surveillance can play a really big part um, in pushing back against some of this, this um, surveillance. Um, if anybody was here last um, meetup, um, Nash from EFF was here talking about um, CCOPS ordinances. And what these basically are is um, local oversight over um, really any government, any local government procurement of um, surveillance technology. And, you know, we've seen a lot more success um, on local efforts um, passing these CCOPS ordinances um, than a in a lot of other areas of anti-surveillance. Um, and so this is a great, um, Sort of a great example of, of where a, a small group of people could get together in, in these different cities and and push for um, more restrictions on police procurement in Georgia. And um, yeah, I thank you so much for that, Scott. I really appreciated all that. Um, and uh, those still here, you'll note I shared a document in the chat. I apologize, I was a little ill prepared on some of my answers earlier because just dealing with technical issues and just other things. And this has been a very busy week in general. But I did just share a report that the activist group Grassroots Leadership put out. And it really is a magnificent resource if you want to know some of the stuff that APD gets up to with surveillance. Um, I will summarize a little bit here just to give you a taste of some of the known things they've gotten up to. Um, so basically they, um, let me, so basically, um, so APD currently has 98 authorized contracts with private companies. 44% uh, of the financial value of these contracts is dedicated to technology surveillance and biometric analysis. Furthermore, APD operates the Austin Regional Intelligence Center, ORIC, a DHS recognized fusion center comprised of 20 local law enforcement agencies. Um, our ORIC um, 
has a troubling history of surveillance, including surveillance of Occupy Wall Street protesters and marchers, surveillance of vegan animal rights activists, using private citizens to conduct surveillance and collect data for ORIC. You can find out more about that in the Chronicle's Blue Leaks reporting. But yes, basically, ORIC was deputizing private citizens in places like churches and basically having them be informants for the cops, actually. Um, also, there's documented surveillance of immigrants for ICE enforcement. Um, some of the specific technologies and software that APD is known to have purchased and used um, are Halo cameras, which are connected to the real-time crime center. Um, there's a $1.2 million contract with Hitachi uh, that provides this. It's a predictive policing camera network, similar to the one that is in Los Angeles that the LAPD has been criticized for using. They also have a contract with uh, Axon Enterprise, which is basically Taser International to supply tasers and body cameras. Um, they also are with CopLink, um, which is a data sharing and crime analytics platform. They also have a contract with Vigilant Solutions, which makes uh, things like automated uh, license plate readers. Um, they have a contract with APRIS Justice Exchange, which is used by ICE agents to track down targets. Uh, LexisNexis Accurant, which is a database with information, including personal phone records, addresses, and public records that would normally take days to collect. And Data Miner, which provides real-time alerts from social media and public data sources. So yeah, APD has a lot of stuff. <laughs> it really does. Um, and you mentioned deputizing people to be the surveillance network for the um, for APD. Um, right now, STOP is working on a local ordinance that is, you know, very specifically directed at Amazon, but could be um, brought in to apply to other companies. Um, that is a is a model for um, banning Amazon Ring, um, which a lot of police departments will have access to. Um, so they don't even need their own video cameras anymore. They can just use the ones on your doorbell. Um, that would that would ban, um, you know, police departments like APD. Um, from entering contracts with, with companies that supply this technology or entering into other agreements to, to use the, the video cameras that are owned by uh, private people. Let's see. Okay. Is there anybody who has not had a chance to contribute or speak yet who would uh, like to chime in on the discussion? It is fine if not, but. I want to make sure uh, we hear from as many people as possible. And I'm, I'm well aware that uh, the virtual format is not always as conducive to these discussions as we would all like. Although I do appreciate that we can beam in people like uh, Evan and have them speak to us. Um, we're, uh, and I guess I will say, if I didn't say at the top, that we are going to have our first in-person meetup in a long time in April. We're gonna try to have it be kind of a hybrid virtual in-person uh, meetup so that we can hopefully get the best of both worlds of this stuff. But yeah, I, I am aware that this stuff can be awkward and less than perfect, but uh, I do appreciate you all for being here and all of the comments that have been contributed so far have been most excellent as always. I really appreciate it too. Um, you know, I've, learned, I've learned a lot from this. Um, hey, a, lot of my, yeah, a lot of my expertise is, um, you know, very, very New York centric. And then a little bit about Austin, a little bit about other places I've lived. Um, but it's great to, to hear more specifics about, um, you know, what exactly is, is going on in Central Texas. Um, uh, yeah, George, did you want to chime in? Yeah, I just wanted to say, well, f uh, first off, I want to say to Evan, it's funny because I used to live in Austin and now I'm in Buffalo, New York. So New York State, not yeah, you know, I remember, pretty far. <laughs> I, remember, I remember talking to you a little bit um, from the last meeting. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, Kevin, I just wanted to mention next month, um, if you need some assistance with that, um, as far as, you know, you'll be there in person, but I'll be remote so I can help you moderate. Yeah, I, certainly. It definitely can be a, a full-time job moderating. Um, yeah, yeah. I, and I frankly wish our one participant hadn't left so suddenly. I would have been happy to unmute him if he just raised his hand. So, yeah. I, you know, it is what it is. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping for some some controversial hot takes in this in this conversation. So, <laughs> we, I mean, we 
we definitely, I will say, and you know, this is true both of the online and the in-person ones that we we draw a wide gamut of people of various uh, ideological beliefs. You, we definitely have been known to sometimes. Our, our audience is almost always respectful, but we've definitely a few times over the years, I've I've pitied a speaker who was put on the spot by somebody who had a very hot take about something, shall we say. I was just gonna say earlier, um, or I was thinking about it earlier when you were talking about the geofencing um, and you know gang activity. And it was like, oh, what if you're friends with a, a, a juggalo? <laughs> Since they've been, you know, by some states, they're considered terrorist organizations. I think the FBI qualified that at one point. Well, I mean, that's exactly the kind of thing that will get you into these databases right. and then have all sorts of repercussions for you in, in your life. I, I mean, and, and I'm curious, I mean, do we have any insight into just how many people get on these databases nationally i know obviously because so much of it is secretive it's hard to get accurate numbers like i know at least like when we're talking about the do not fly list it's known that there's actually like a couple million people on that list which seems kind of absurd the idea that there's a couple million terrorists in the u.s but yeah i'm just curious how much we know about how many people how laughably broad are these lists they're they are laughably broad. Um, in New York, it's hundreds of thousands of people. You already mentioned the do not fly list. Um, it's you know similar in Chicago um, where they have a, a similar gang database of hundreds of thousands of people. Um, and it really is a lot of um, black and Latino, Latina um, people who get put on the list. It's, you know, it's, it's not people who look like me. Um, and it's, it's um, really concerning that um, you know, some of this like historic bias policing is now getting automated into these technologies. Um, and we're just normalizing it because nobody, nobody questions what sort of variables are going into the, uh, the database. And I, I guess I will say without trying to let my personal political beliefs show, although, you know, it's probably not too hard to guess them, but, you know, I'm just like, so, I mean, like, does in your observation from when you guys have interfaced with law enforcement over this stuff like do they find value in having these comically broad lists where like even by their own admission and they'd have to admit that like 90 percent of the people on the list are not actually worth wasting resources on because they're not a suspect or a criminal like it seems like they're only making their own lives harder having so much data they have to sift through to find the actual relevant data. I mean, you're always going to get law enforcement saying, oh, no, it, it generates leads. It, it helps us. But then you ask them like, oh, what like actual information have you gotten from this? And like, oh, we won't tell you or they won't they won't say. Um, but I, but even some some people. Um, this is not from my personal experience meeting with anybody, but just from reading different things, we'll say that there are just so many people on the lists that it can be hard to, to sift through all the noise to find anything relevant. I mean, that's sort of my question where like, you know, even, you know, ignoring my personal political beliefs about law enforcement, I'm just like, purely from a pure self-interest standpoint, don't, don't they, do they have any issue with that they're literally making their jobs harder by drowning themselves in irrelevant data? You would think so. Yeah, I, I mean, it just, even, you know, ignoring, you know, ideological things, I'm just like, that doesn't make sense to me. Not to mention that, like, I mean, like, data warehousing, endless hours of video live streams gets incredibly expensive incredibly quickly. You'd almost think you'd at least want to be more selective in what you're saving. But, you know, what do I know? <laughs> well, the, there's also yeah. the um, motivation of somebody gets that money. So, I mean, like the, you know, especially after 9-11, there was a lot of money going out and being spent on stupid stuff because there was a lot of money out there. And right. it's just kind of how, how things work. That's what we see a lot is that even some tools that were designed for one purpose, they just sell it as a miracle solution to whatever the problem of the day is. So we saw a lot of um, these law enforcement technology companies rebranding their tools as um, contact tracing tech. 
um, during the COVID pandemic. And right. Not, yeah. So. Yeah, I was know. wondering, like, to what extent these databases ended up including people from the BLM protests, like, just because they can. And, uh, you know, like, I, I was a legal observer, and I'm sure that, you know, I mean, I, you know, I'm not too worried about being on the radar for that, mm -hmm. but I don't want to be on the radar for anything. That would be interesting to see. Yeah. That would be interesting to see. Usually there are multiple criteria that go into putting you into the database. Um, but I mean, if there were if there were people already in the database there and um, you're in the same location, um, I guess it depends if that location was known to be um, somewhere that criminal activity takes place. Um, or if there was criminal activity during the protest. I mean, yeah, there was um, some, you know. I can say in New York that those two factors would be enough to put you into the database, um, but I don't know how how many actually how many of those protesters actually were included. And I guess one one thing I think Stop might be very uh, knowledgeable about, but you know one one reform that I think seems like such a no brainer, and it would be hard to know how anybody except maybe law enforcement would not be behind this reform, but just the ability to even query these lists and find out if you're on them and why like is there any movement on at least getting that level of transparency and if if there's roadblocks to that like what what is the pushback other than law enforcement it's just hard to fathom anyone would be against being able to find out who's on these lists and why they're on them i think that's a great idea it, it, i would love to be able to, to see if i was on these lists um, this I mean, I, I just assume that because yeah. I'm involved with EFF Austin, I assume I'm already on some heightened interest list, but, you know, but I figure me and several million other people, you know. <laughs> I, I have not done any work on this at stop, but I do remember that, um, you know, years ago, there was a lot of effort of like people should know when they're on the do not fly list or different right. terrorist watch list, because um, oftentimes they're, they're on there for just a ridiculous reason and they're on nice there because they have the same name as someone yeah. who did something. Yeah, like literally that. <laughs> I think that's 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 probably an idea that we should bring back. I think that's a, a pretty common sense reform. Um, well, it just it just seems like even people who like like don't you know as you said you know a, a lot of people the the privacy angle you know that that's too abstract for them they don't really care but like that right there just seems like who could be against that you know. I think that's a really great idea. <laughs> well, well, maybe, uh, maybe when I see you in person next week, we can chat about how to get some movement on that. Yeah. Are there anybody? It does it, Would anybody else like to to chime in? If not, yeah. it's okay. Yeah, I mean, I I have managed to get enough of the audience participating that I don't feel like it's just me. And uh, yeah, you know, and it really depends on the speaker because some speakers just are fine talking the whole time. But I, I know Evan, uh, you are in the Socratic spirit of EFF Austin and really want to have a debate. <laughs> so I uh, tried to get as many people chiming in as possible. But um, yeah, if anybody has any more thoughts or has not spoken yet and would like to chime up. Um, do that being said we are you know starting to get toward the end of our lot of time we don't have to drag it all the way out to nine so if people have heard what they want to hear and ask we don't necessarily have to drag it out well that being said before i let you all go here i'll let you know that one thing we try to do yet again in an effort to make this uh this cobbled together metaverse of ours a little more fun and engaging is we tend to try to have virtual um, sort of post meetup happy hours, much like we would often go for drinks in the real world. Um, and obviously hanging out in in Zoom, it can be weird. <laughs> it just is. So we've um, a friend of ours here in Austin, a guy named Mike Furstenfeld, who runs a production company called Make Every Media. He has a Gather Town room that he graciously lets us use. For those of you who've never used Gather Town, it is basically kind of like playing an old 16-bit RPG video game with an overhead 
overhead view and you have avatars, but it basically simulates kind of a virtual party. You can wander around and, and gasp, like if you walk away from a conversation, you'll stop hearing those people. So it, it's, I find it's a lot more fun way to socialize than uh, Zoom is. So if any of you would like to actually, uh, you know, just chat or, uh, you know, hang out for a little bit, I'll hang out in there at least for a little bit for everyone. Um, I encourage everybody who has a little time to join us. I'm posting the link here. If you click that on that page, you'll see a place where it says day pass link below. If you click that, you should be able to get into the room. I will leave this room open just a little bit so you can snag that URL if you're interested. But anyway, I will uh, also reiterate that next week, if you are in Austin, um, we will be meeting up at the Downtown Public Library from 3 to 5 p.m. during South by Southwest. We'll celebrate that we have a new Spiffy website. We'll chat about digital civil liberties. I think uh, Evan may be there so you can chat with him more in person if you didn't get your fill. And, uh, and just, you know, it'll be real fun to have an in-person gathering after god i think it's been two years since we had any kind of in-person event so that will be uh, a lot of fun uh so i hope to see some of you there and if we don't see you there i hope we'll see you uh at capital factory on the second uh tuesday of april at 7 p.m where we'll have ed cavazos um we will also still have means for you to attend virtually either with zoom or with YouTube Live, um, if you uh, still prefer to attend virtually, either for your own health reasons or just because you know getting downtown is hard for you, and we want to remain accessible. So um, yeah, I want to thank Evan so much for a very informed talk, uh, and really learned a lot. Before we um, all sign off, I just like to say, if you want to have me talk again or somebody else from Stop, um, I gave sort of a an overview about. Stop's general work and our, our approach to this sort of advocacy. Um, but if you want to dive deeper on media strategy or communications or Twitter or anything like that, um, feel free to reach out to me. And if um, I think somebody who focuses on that aspect of our work more than I do would be a better fit, then I will um, gladly reach out to them to see if they would like to, um, you know, talk to EFF Austin in one of these meetups or with any other groups that might be looking for a little support um, in their advocacy. Oh, we absolutely appreciate it. We both, uh, I'm, I'm always hungry for meetup speakers. So I definitely may ping you or Albert or other people from STOP, uh, you know, if I need more meetup talks, absolutely. And uh, yeah, and definitely also, uh, I think with you kind of as STOP's uh, Austin area liaison, I definitely think I'm going to be in continuing conversations with you about advice about how we can maybe continue to step up our game in the areas that you guys are so good at. Now that uh, I've mostly got the website redesign off my plate, I can actually think about improving other things. <laughs> Gasp. Um, Sounds but, great. But yeah, and Evan, um, if you do have a little time to stick around, um, I'd love to chat for a minute uh, and gather if you're free, but, um, and anybody else who's free. But um, if you all have to run, I quite understand. But as always, thank you all so much for uh, supporting us. And, um, and once again, sorry, I always do try to communicate it clearly at the beginning of the meetup, but apologies again if there's any confusion about why I have the security permissions I do. Believe me, I can't wait to be in person where if you want to speak up, it's as simple as speaking up. So thank you all everybody for continuing to support us. We look forward to seeing you hopefully in the, the physical realm soon, but until then, we'll see you around. Thank you all so much.